policy, social, personal, no matter what, our ethnicity or orientation, we come from the land of aloha. This has always been what sets us apart. In Hawaii, we take you as you are and let you be as you wish to be. That is the essence of Hawaii. That is what makes us a safe haven for people of every background and orientation. As other states recognize the rights of same-sex couples to marry, we cannot stand by and watch. Now, I understand the desire by some seek seeking guidance from their religious teachings. I, too, am a faith-based senator. And that is why, under the bill proposed, no church or synagogue or mosque would be required to perform or sanction a same-sex wedding, as is the case in every state that has legalized marriage equality. Long ago, the Supreme Court declared that separate but equal opportunities are inherently unequal. It took this U.S. Supreme Court nearly 60 years after Plessy versus Ferguson which upheld disparate treatment uh, of non-whites to come to that conclusion. It took the Supreme Court another 13 years to strike down laws barring interracial marriage, and another 36 years after that to strike down laws criminalizing same-sex relationships. And of course, the recent Supreme Court decision on the Defense of Marriage Act. The march for equality and tolerance in America has sometimes been slow, but it's never stopped. That's democracy. Governor either treats everyone the same or it doesn't, and right now it doesn't. That desire for equal standing in society is extraordinarily powerful and has led to extraordinary advances in American freedom. Colleagues, there is no retreating to a past that has disappeared. There is no holding back a wave that has crested. And there is no denying a freedom that belongs to us all. The time has come for us to allow thousands of men and women to become full members of the American family. Together we can work across the aisle to pass a bill allowing all of citizens to walk down the aisle and lead our state and country toward a more perfect union. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Stone. Thank you, Madam President. Colleagues, I stand in strong opposition to this bill. Please proceed. Thank you. During the past hour, we've heard many good comments, many good thoughts. And the curtain is coming down today on the drama that has been this political theater. Because in fact, this was not a special session. It was totally scripted, totally politicized. The votes were extracted and taken before we ever met, or we wouldn't have met. As I said previously, on many occasions, there was no reason, no urgency, for a special session devoted to sexual orientation. In the past 12 years, this state has had two special sessions unrelated to the Senate's advising and consenting to judicial or cabinet nominees. One had to do with the super ferry and the economic implications. The other was called immediately after 9-11, when we were all concerned about what was going to be the future of our state and our nation. To say that the argument for sexual orientation rises to that level is absurd. To say that this is historic is untrue. Hysteric it may be. We should have decided it, if at all, during the regular session. Lord knows we've spent years and years on this topic. For those of you that have not heard me over the past 20 years, I've said very loudly and very clearly, the legislature and government should not be involved in marriage. You did not have to worry about separation of church and state, not in our legislature, because you didn't hear a prayer at the beginning of this session. You haven't heard a prayer in several years. Because again, special interests 
who pushed the issue pushed us back. Are we truly the representatives of the people, of all the people? I think not. I heard mixed arguments this morning. One is that the tide of history has changed, that people have changed, and so we should listen to them. Except when it means giving them the right to let the people decide. Then we don't want to listen to them. Oh yeah, they're smart enough to vote for us or not vote at all. The public is smart enough to create a salary commission to give us all salary increases automatically. The people are smart enough to vote for a rail to nowhere, but they're not smart enough to vote on basic issues. And why don't legislators want the public to vote? Because the public will vote overwhelmingly in opposition to same-sex marriage. The other night, during our 12-hour hearing, we had between six and 8,000 people outside, even more if you looked around the corners and on the lawn and everywhere else. Many of those people did not get an opportunity to testify, even though they had signed up to do so. Other people who had signed up early did not get the opportunity to testify. And most of these people, if not all of them, were in opposition. The figures released of those that did get to testify showed that more than 60% were in opposition. And yet, we do not want to let the people decide. And there's a real problem with that. Hawaii is the only state out of the 50, or 57 as our president insists, the only state that has neither statewide initiative, referendum, recall, or term limits. So what is the public to do? The public comes down here seeking an opportunity to testify and to participate, and they're denied that. And then they seek to talk to us to talk about reason and rationality and law and our minds had already been made up. And now we celebrate a momentous time in history. And individuals have gotten up and told about how they have evolved. They're very proud of their evolution. The governor evolved from his statements as a candidate in 2010. My colleagues in the Senate and in the House that are running for a higher office, they've evolved because they stick their finger up in the wind to see where the votes may be, where the activism may be. And in full disclosure, I married interracially. I have two beautiful interracial sons. I am not a Christian or a Catholic, yet religious. And yet I see a continuing attack and onslaught against Christians and Catholics and people of religion in this community and elsewhere. We were told five years ago that our president, his administration, and his followers were going to transform America, the one promise that has been kept. And those that accuse people like me of not evolving, not changing, not going along with the tide and the wave and all of that, stubbornly, steadfastly sticking to tradition and to the Constitution and to what is right, we're called all kinds of names. And we've been given threats as well. And by the way, let me say, there is no room for non-respect or lack of civility in this or any other discussion. And the fact that we've had it is sad. This issue, which should not be part of a legislative agenda, especially when we have an economy in shambles, people out of work, 
people who can't afford food or health care or proper education for their children. We heard about education, but we didn't hear about how we continue to rank low or lowest among the states in educational attainment. We have a terrible infrastructure. We have problems in health care. We have problems with the homeless, with Native Hawaiians and others. And yet we champion this cause, which is not about equal rights. It is about extending a privilege. The Loving case does not apply here. It involved a man and a woman. And while there were wrongs committed in our country and they were redressed, calling something equality and carving out a right does not necessarily make it so, no matter how loud the voices are, no matter how people champion it, like our media, which has been in the bag from the beginning, does not report news, special interest groups and political parties. By calling an elephant a donkey does not make it so. Marriage is marriage. It is separate. We can have disagreements on that. We can talk about equal rights in other areas. But we have become a nation and a state where people every day talk about their new rights that they have. And they misconstrue privilege for right. And they misconstrue entitlements for rights. Our rights are God-given, yet we are told now we can't even allow God in our house. At a time when lawmakers particularly, as smart as we are, and you all know how smart we are, at a time when we have all of these problems, we are not even allowed to seek divine guidance. And yet we are listening to the voices who say, we represent change, we represent something new. At one point, we're told, listen to the majority. At another point, we're told, don't listen to the majority. Well, I know a little bit about that being the only one here in the state Senate. This is not a partisan issue, or it should not be. And yet, interesting, interestingly, some of the activists pop up in the same issues against religion, against prayer, against a free enterprise capitalist American system, in fact, against America. And we have people that say that the Constitution of the United States is outmoded, that it should be changed, it should be ignored selectively. These people have not read and do not understand the Constitution of the United States or the state of Hawaii. We had a 12-hour hearing the other day. Three years ago, we had an 18-hour non-stop continuous hearing that I was part of in the Senate. I encourage people to come forward. I encourage people to give their views and opinions. But you should understand that the legislature is not that all-wise and all-seeing. We all have our fallacies and our foibles. And for us to make decisions for a community that is so divided now, just like our nation, is not the best use of our time or our resources. And I have to say that in listening to everyone, yes, there were some intemperate remarks made, yes, there was repetitive statements made, and yes, there were statements that really were not on point about this issue. Legal scholars, in fact, do differ about whether or not same-sex marriage should be allowed and should be taken under the tent of equal rights. They differ. And yet these views, as are my views, 
are told that we're out of step. And we're finding more and more in our country and in our legislative bodies that anybody that has a different view is not given that equality of speech. And that's where this bill fails. This bill is an attack, attack on religious freedom and the First Amendment. Make no mistake about it. The so-called protections in this bill, as written now, will not protect religious organizations and their facilities. This bill gives additional legal causes of action, and people will use them. They will continue to sue. Years ago, we were told, if you just pass reciprocal beneficiaries, then everything will be fine. And then we were told, if you just pass civil unions, everything would be fine. And yet, honestly, those people who have advocated on the front lines for same-sex marriage have always done so, and that's their right and their privilege. But they haven't been honest and open about it. And are there problems with reciprocal beneficiaries, domestic partners, and civil unions? Yes, there are. And I've said over and over again, in those areas that deny people the right to take care of one another or to visit in the hospital or to have power of attorney, those part of the law, those parts of the law that do not meet those standards, then change them. We can do that. That's something that the legislature could do. That's something that the Congress can do. But there was a lot of misinformation the other day, including, with all due respect, our former Supreme Court Justice, Mr. Levinson. First of all, the DOMA law, the Defense of Marriage Act, was not struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court. A section was, and it applied primarily to California and New York. The Supreme Court has not ruled that same-sex marriage is both an equal right and deserved. And Mr. Levinson talked about Iowa, and he was incorrect because in Iowa, the state Supreme Court struck down the same-sex marriage provision, and three of the justices who supported it were removed by the Iowa residents of course, we don't allow election of judges either in the state of Hawaii. Maybe we should revisit that too, Madam President. Because for those people that didn't like the plantation system in Hawaii, you're sitting in the new plantation right here. We tell you what to think, we tell you what to wear, we tell you who to hire, we tell you how much to pay, we tell you that you must have insurance. We tell you all these things. We are the plantation here. We have more monopolies in this state than anywhere else. We have more unholy alliances between businesses and government than any other state. And then we wonder why our people are struggling. And there are a lot of people that have been afraid in this debate to speak out, and that's a shame. But they are, for one reason or another. And I fully expect in the next few days you're going to hear comments from the Native Hawaiian community about how devastating this law would be to them. And they'll be more specific about it. But all those people that have been cheerleading letting us believe everybody's in favor of this. It's only those, those few people that are political misanthropes or social laggards, as was described in a publication the other day. It's only us that are opposed to this. Let the people vote. Let the people decide. Let's find out. But we're not going to do that because everything here has been neatly done. And that's a shame. And that is not democracy. 
and that reflects poorly upon everyone, gay and straight, Republican and Democrat. We have problems in this state, and we have not addressed them. We have so much talent here, and it doesn't matter about your political party or your sexual orientation. But when we try to force people to do certain things that they don't want to do, that is not positive. This bill, this bill will not advance life, liberty, or happiness in this state. This bill will not improve our economic conditions. Oh, yes, I know. I know there have been studies saying if we just do this, wow, we'll have more people, more gay and lesbians coming to Hawaii to enjoy our state and spend money. But there will be other people that will be concerned about that lifestyle and, and concerned about our image. At last count, 14 states, in fact, have legalized some sort of same-sex marriage which leaves, in my public school math, 36 states that have not. We talk all the time about trying to better the lives of people. If we worked on our economy, if we worked on making Hawaii a better place, then in fact all people, regardless of their religious outlook, regardless of their sexual orientation, is going to, is going to benefit. And that's what we're here for. And you have to hold our feet to the fire, not just on a single issue, but on what we're doing for the state. We are all public servants. We all are beholden to you. You pay for everything we do. But you've got to be more involved. You've got to be more engaged. And don't let me hear any of you say your vote doesn't matter. You don't matter. Your vote in this issue matters. Your vote in every issue matters. So I appeal to my colleagues that before they uncork the bottles of champagne, that they be fully concerned about what this measure and others like it do in our community. We should be working to bring people together. We should be working to help those people who need help. This is not the case. And we've learned over the years and particularly over the last couple of days that this issue is not about love. It's not about compassion. It's not about equal rights. It's about money. It's about tax benefits. It's about federal benefits. And even the Attorney General, in his very unique way of answering questions, had to admit that if you want to go to another state, as many people do on a regular basis, including to get married, you will not lose those benefits. You will gain those benefits. But you know what it tells me? It tells me that what I've been fighting for the 18 years I've been here, that our taxes are too high, our government regulations too unfair, the fees and everything that are eating you alive. That's what we should be doing. That's what we should be together on on a bipartisan basis. So I'll leave you with this thought. Passing a law like this is not going to solve our problems, is not going to make divisions go away. But it will get people concerned who have been disenfranchised and who realize that their government is going in a different direction from them. It's not bad to disagree on any issue. And it certainly is not bad to stick up for your beliefs and your rights and your freedom of speech. I believe that this bill will be compromised and I will continue to oppose it. Thank you.
further discussion. Senator Baker. Thank you, Madam President. I rise in I strong- I remind the public again to refrain from any audio, any kind of responses. Otherwise, we will clear the chamber, uh, the gallery. Please proceed, Senator Baker. Thank you, Madam President. I rise in strong support of Equal Rights and Senate Bill 1. Please proceed. I firmly believe that equal rights delayed are equal rights denied. And perhaps the urgency was brought on by the Supreme Court action on the defense of marriage. But even if it hadn't come from that, I still think this is an action we should have taken and it's appropriate to do it now. There were hearings. We've all received email, letters, phone calls, and other communications, in-person visits. So it's not as if we don't understand the issues or even know what our constituents think. It is about equal protection of the laws, in my view. I grew up in the Deep South. I, went to, I started first grade in 1952. Graduated high school in 64, went to college, graduated college in 68. For the entire 12 years of my elementary, high, middle school, and high school years, I did not go to school with one black child, although there were plenty of black children in my town. They went to a separate school. I've seen up close and personal the ugly face of discrimination. And with every minority group, you simply don't put their rights on the ballot for a popular vote because like the decision to get rid of the so-called separate but equal doctrine, if we put that on the ballot, do you think that those black schools would have gone out of existence in the state of Texas? No, they wouldn't have. And those children who deserved the kind of good quality education that I received with teachers well qualified to teach them and paid equally what the teachers in my school were paid at the time wouldn't have happened. We wouldn't have had any of the advancements in equal rights if they'd been put up to a popular vote. Minorities don't ever get their rights that way. And that, to me, is one of the fundamental reasons that we need to continue to move Senate Bill 1 forward. It is about equality of rights under the law. And as long as marriage has a status in our code, whether it's tax, whether it's being able to um, make sure that your children uh, or your partner's wishes are upheld in, if you pass, it is tied up with what's in our statute. And it does make an unequal situation. I met a, a woman yesterday. I'd gone over to the UH Cancer Center to uh, hear an eminent uh, distinguished professor on public policy dealing with smoking and e-cigarettes, thinking that you know these are some of the things we may be dealing with. And I had an occasion to talk to his wife after. And she relayed to me, she said, I understand you folks are you know, dealing with enabling same-sex marriage in, in Hawaii. And she was from California. And she says, I just want to relate a story to you, uh, what happened to a friend of mine. And I think it will give you if you needed any additional reason for supporting uh, uh, the enactment of Senate Bill 1, uh, this would be something you might want to consider. She had friends, a couple, a lesbian couple, who had a son. And the couple was driving down the highway, and another car hit them almost head on, uh, killed one of the women. The other one went to the hospital. The young son, who was strapped into a backseat um, um, seat, uh, well, it was in, he was in a, in a, in a child restraint, because he was only about 18 months old, I think, in the back seat, and he survived without a scratch. The woman who was killed happened to be his birth mother. 
his other mother went to the hospital. The grandmother, the mother of the birth mother, came and took the child. And when the other mother came out of the hospital and was well enough to be reunited with her son and take care of that son, the grandmother made sure that that woman never, ever saw her son again. That's why we need same-sex marriage, to provide those protections for couples in committed relationships who may have children. But that's just one example. I think it's important for us to understand how fundamental equal rights are in our Constitution, in our form of government, and do everything that we can to ensure it. That's one of the reasons that I'm standing in strong support of Senate Bill 1. But it's also because with the DOMA decision, we have folks who are civil union couples in our state but cannot access the full benefits that the decision of the United States Supreme Court with regard to federal benefits allowed. And I was very pleased when the chair of the Judiciary and Labor Committee asked for the Attorney General to provide the committee with a list of those benefits that would be denied if we did not pass same-sex marriage in our state and continue to have our folks be unequal under the law. And Madam President, uh, I think all of my colleagues received a copy of that memorandum. Uh, in our email this morning, and with uh, your permission, I'd like to have that included in the journal as another example of why uh, we need to be moving this measure forward. So ordered. Thank you, Madam President. I want to close with some of the words of Eleanor Roosevelt. She happens to be one of my mentors and one of the people that I look look up to uh, as I do Patsy Mink. And I think it's, these are very instructive. She begins, where after all do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person the neighborhood that he or she lives in, the school or college where he or she attends, the factory farm or, farm or office where he or she works. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seek equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Madam President, I submit that's what SB1 does. Mahalo. Thank you. Further discussion, member Madam Senator President. Ige. Yes, I rise to speak, uh, speak in support of this measure. Please proceed. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I support Senate Bill 1 as it seeks to balance um, providing equal rights and protections and benefits to same-sex couples as opposite-sex couples. I did want to commend the chair of the Ju Judiciary and Labor Committee for his work on the bill seeking to find the appropriate balance of protecting religious freedoms with providing equal rights. I did want to comment, all of you know that we were summoned here to deal with this issue. This was not of our choosing. Uh, but I did want to commend the Senate Judiciary and Labor Committee and all of the members of the committee for their work on this bill. I think for anyone who observed the hearings and, and more importantly, I guess the staff for organizing it in the way that they did. I think for anyone who observed the hearings, uh, I think they would all agree that even though we did not have the time to hear each and every individual who showed up and wanted to speak, I thought that the discourse was very respectful. The committee was managed very well. The members engaged both those in support and those in opposition in appropriate and in-depth questions that allowed the entire community to benefit from the conversation. And I think at the end of the day, at 10 p.m. or so, when the committee had concluded their work and the final vote was taken, I really believe that many felt that both sides had the opportunity to share their opinions and their perspectives on the measure, and the committee had lis listened patiently and engaged, uh, and the votes fell where they may. 
So once again, I just would like to commend the chair, the committee, and the staff for really managing the situation that we were put in uh, very respectfully and thoughtfully. And I think at the end of the day today, we have an opportunity to vote our conscience and make the decision to provide equal treatment to same-sex couples. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion. Senator Gabbard. Madam President, I rise in strong opposition to SB1. Please proceed. I, too, would like to say mahalo to the Judiciary Chair and his staff for laboring long and hard in crafting the bill. Also, let me thank the same senator who represents the North Shore and his staff for all their hard work in putting together our Judiciary Labor Committee hearing on Monday that was run very well, very orderly. And also, of course, mahalo to the Senate clerks, the Sergeant of Arms, and the sheriffs who did a masterful job at Monday's almost 12-hour hearing. Colleagues, here in Hawaii, we have been having this statewide conversation about same-sex marriage for about 23 years. And sometimes the discussions have been civil, cordial, and productive. At other times, there have been death threats, bodily harm, TROs, and speaking from personal experience, even businesses being forced to close because of the owners publicly opposing same-sex marriage. And I know the emails have been pouring into your offices as well. Let's see. I'm sure most of you did not get the ones calling you a hater, a homophobe, a Nazi, etc. I think those are reserved for the minority leader and myself. But maybe you got the ones calling you Satan and that you're going to burn in hell eternally if you vote the wrong way on this measure. So much for the Aloha spirit. My point is that this has been a contentious, contentious divisive issue for over 20 years. And some of you may be thinking, yeah, okay, so enough already. Let's put it to rest. Let's be the 15th state in the country to legalize same-sex marriage and be done with it. But if we do that, do you really think that this issue will be any less contentious? Right now, the most recent poll by Honolulu Civil Beat shows the people of our state are now split down the middle with 44% in favor and 44% opposed to legalizing same-sex marriage. So the obvious question is, why the urgency, and why are we trying to cram an issue of this magnitude into a short special session? As Senator Ige mentioned, we are, it was imposed. We did not decide to be here on our own. This was imposed upon us. We all saw the thousands of people that showed up on money to lend their voices on both sides of the issue, but we unfortunately didn't give the same opportunity to the people on the neighbor <laughs> islands. What about that farmer in Kanakakai? who couldn't afford the airfare to come to Oahu to testify? What about the mother of three in Poipu, who feels so strongly about expressing her point of view at the public hearing, whether for or against, but again, could not afford the plane fare and the babysitters? I know some people have said, hey, we've talked this issue to death, and we've already heard all of the arguments. That may very well be. But the real issue here is, have we really done all that we can to give the opportunity for people's voices to be heard. After all, isn't that what the democratic process is all about? This is even more reason that we should heed the advice of the people who are urging us to let the people decide by putting this back on the ballot in 2014 as a constitutional amendment. The fact is there are many valid concerns that opponents of this bill have, have and it's a mistake to ram this through without taking the time to really address them. What I heard during our marathon hearing on Monday is that people are very worried about the protection of religious freedom and how this also will impact our children's education. And although I acknowledge the assurances from the senator for, from Kailua and senator from Waipahu about opt-out provisions in DOE policy, for our taxpayer-funded public schools, people should not have to worry about their kids being taught that homosexual relations are normal and natural if that isn't what they believe. Yet, based on the ex experience of other jurisdictions with same-sex marriage, both in this country and abroad, it's likely this will happen. Will the tax-paying parents who strongly oppose same-sex marriage be forced to homeschool or send their kids to private schools to keep their values, their family's values, intact? We all know this issue isn't going to go away if SB1 passes into law. So what I'm asking is, let's take some more time to really figure this out. Let's take this issue on the road to all the islands. Let's talk story, continue the conversation, and let people on both sides weigh in and possibly come up with the Aloha solution. 
Let's vote this down today and resume our deliberations in the upcoming session in January. Colleagues, I urge you to vote no on SB1. Mahalo and keakua meke aloha. Further discussion, Member Senator Thielen. Thank you, Madam President. I rise in support of SB1. Please proceed. I can't be as eloquent as many of the speakers who came before me. I, I actually didn't plan to speak. I think the Senate Judiciary Chair and, and many of the others have really stated the reasons why I support this bill. But I am rising today because I want to address some of the remarks that were made by the Senate Minority Leader, particularly about the um, separation of church and state. The Senate Minority Leader saying that uh, he didn't hear this session open with prayer and implied that special interests are lobbying to push this bill and to restrict the freedom of religion and expression. I stand before you with a slightly different view on the freedom of religion. As I've shared with many of you, I am a direct descendant of William Brewster, who was one of the leaders of the pilgrims who came over to this uh, the mainland country on the Mayflower. And the reason that he left England is because he practiced a religion that was different than the official religion of the Church of England. And he published sermons about his religion. And he and the fellow, fellow believers in his religion were under threat of their life. And so they fled first to the Netherlands. And while he was in the Netherlands, he continued to publish sermons from his religion. And the Church of England sent representatives over to the town of Leiden to ask the Dutch government to repatriate him back to England, either to jail him or to execute him. And because they were worried about the relationship between the Dutch and the British, the Puritans then secured the Mayflower and sailed to the New World to start a new country. I am also the direct descendant of one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry refused to sign the United States Constitution because he felt it centralized too much power and control in the federal government. And it was not respectful of the rights of the citizens. And he and others were instrumental in getting the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, added to the United States Constitution. And the very first amendment in that Constitution is the separation of church and state. It prohibits the government from establishing a religion. And it does that not because it is against religion. It does it to protect everyone's right to their own religious beliefs. It does it because government has to be neutral. It does it to protect people like my ancestor, so government cannot say that one religion is right and believers of a different faith are wrong and that you cannot pray in that way. I think while there's been much talk about the fact that we've had a special session and didn't listen to people, I think if people take a look at the bill in SB1 and the original draft of the bill, you will see that there was a lot of listening. We received a lot of testimony, a lot of calls, had a lot of meetings before this session ever began when the first draft of the bill was posted by the governor's office. I know the two chairs of the Judiciary Committee on the House and the Senate side both worked with the Attorney General's office to try and address those concerns. I was on the phone a number of times to try and address uh, ask them to address the concerns as well with the bill because I support the freedom of religion. But I also support same-sex marriage as an equal right. And I don't speak as somebody who has evolved. I campaigned against the constitutional amendment 15 years ago by going door to door in my neighborhood to ask people to vote against it because I felt that the judicial interpretation that our Constitution allowed freedom of same-gender marriage should have been honored from the beginning. And I would never put that right up for a popular vote, just as I would never put up the First Amendment for a popular vote. Because these are ingrained. These Bill of Rights are what make our country unique 
in the world. We did do a lot of changes from the original draft in the bill, and I stand before today again thanking the Senate Judiciary Chair and others for making sure that those went into place. I feel that we have found a very, very good balance that respects the full First Amendment rights of freedom of religion for the churches, but also respects the equal rights to be free from discrimination for the same gender couples, and it ensures that government acts in a neutral manner when we issue government licenses so that we do not discriminate based upon gender orientation and marriage. Thank you. Further discussion? If not, Senator Ihara. Madam President, I rise in support of Senate Bill 1. Please proceed. <clears throat> Madam President, I was inspired by the speech from our newest senator from Maui, who is looking forward to his um, eighth wedding anniversary. For many years, I had thought about taking a stand and not marrying until everyone has that right. But when I found the love of my life, I could not withhold marrying. This past February, my wife and I celebrated our seventh wedding anniversary. And I know my wife's views on this issue, so I am dedicating my vote today to her. So that we may allow all of our gay friends also the happiness of marriage. And if and when Senate bill passes, this will indeed be a very, very special session. Thank you, Madam President. Further discussion, members? Senator Sloan. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Just a, a very brief rebuttal. Um, we talked earlier, and the majority leader talked about compromise, and, and I certainly agree with that. I think the mark of any good legislation is the fact that in the end, people have compromised, and they come to an agreement, and they can accept what there is. Despite what has been said over and over again, there are no religious protections in this bill as written now. And the proof of that is no religious person who had opposed the original legislation came forward and said, oh, yeah, you guys really did a good job. You really worked hard. You really were in there together to make sure that there was a balance. There is no balance in this bill. It is totally one-sided. And so those people that may be surprised later on, after this becomes law, if it does, should not be surprised because we've discussed it. Madam President, I call for a roll call vote. So ordered. Further discussion? Senator He. Thank you, Madam. Madam President, I rise in support. Please proceed. <clears throat> First, I want to thank my colleagues who have been overly generous in, in, the, in, in, in thanking me for running the, the hearing on Monday. And I'm, very, I'm grateful and appreciative. And as I said yesterday, it, it could not have been done but for the uh, organized efforts of our Senate clerk, the sergeant at arms, and the sheriffs, and, and the staff. So I'm very appreciative. And of course, the members of the committee. Uh, uh, I want to say something uh, in some of the dialogue that I've heard o over the time. And I want to do so in the context of some of the soundbite statements made by the minority leader. Uh, many of which are frankly untrue. If you can read English, and if you can read Senate Bill Number 1, it's explicit in its religious protections. But I know I'm talking the choir boy singing to the choir, because I think all of you can read English. Evidently, some of us refuse to read English. And I'll leave it at that. The minority leader talked about surprises. 
Well, it should come as no surprise to him that in 1998, when he voted aye on House Bill 117, Senate Draft 1, Conference Draft 1, that he voted aye on the following bill, which said in part, quote, the legislature further finds that the question of whether or not the state should issue marriage license to couples of the same sex is a fundamental policy issue to be decided by the elected representatives of the people. He voted aye. His tune has changed. The bill con continues, this constitutional measure is thus designed to confirm that the legislature has the power to reserve marriage to opposite sex couples. And here is the part that he evidently does not understand in English. And to ensure that the legislature shall, will remain open to the petitions of those who seek a change in the marriage laws and that such petitioners can be considered on an equal basis with those who oppose a change in our current marriage statutes. He voted aye. He voted aye with six other members who, who are with us today. On October 28th, Monday, Professor Robin Freewell Wilson, a professor at law at the University of Illinois and co-editor of Same-Sex Marriage and Religious Liberty Emerging Conflicts, said in a published article, in the Star Advertiser. That Senate Bill 1, and I'm quoting now, sensibly says, the facility be used for profit and donations don't count, is an improvement over the governor's proposal. She says that the religious freedoms <laughs> that exist, and I'm summarizing now, that exist today remain tomorrow should this bill become law. Although she writes that there should be other improvements to be considered. She makes it very clear <laughs> that the religious freedoms protected and enjoyed today remain tomorrow in Senate Bill 1 as enshrined in the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the State of Hawaii. Thank you very much. Senator English. Madam President, I rise in support of the measure. Please proceed. I take exception to some of the statements made by the minority leader regarding the positions and views of Native Hawaiians. He's hardly the one to speak on our behalf. I'd like to enter into the record today the editorial that was in the um, Honolulu Star Advertiser this morning by Hinale Moana Wong Kalu titled, Hawaiian Values Differ from Western Traditions. So ordered. And just to summarize, what Hina talks about is basically saying you cannot merge the idea of Hawaiian values and Western. You cannot choose between the two and have both of them. Either you practice Hawaiian culture and you choose to do so, or you choose a Christian culture, you choose a Roman Catholic culture, you choose a Buddhist culture. It doesn't matter. The point is that you cannot merge the two. I think that the article is germane today 
because it lays out some of the traditional Hawaiian marriages. Aikane, Punalua, and other types of marriages. This is our traditional Hawaiian marriages. So when people say, let's defend traditional marriage, yes, of course, I defend the traditional Hawaiian marriages. So I'd like to enter this into the record so that we have a clear understanding of what exactly this means. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Solomon. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I also rise in support. Please proceed. And uh, I would like to support the remarks that were made by the uh, Judiciary Chairman. And uh, I was part of that 1998 where we all voted, and I do strongly believe that these matters must be settled in the legislature. And if I may, Madam Chairman, I'd like to just deviate from the issues that have just been uh, discussed by the, all the previous speakers, just to remind this body that the persons that really have been discriminated in the state of Hawaii have been the Native Hawaiians. And I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm very uh, pleased that we have come so far in our thoughts of how we have evolved. <laughs> and I'm hoping that these thoughts will still continue when we look at the Hawaiian issues as those of being equal rights. You know, we have been, uh, and, I wanna, and I wanna give a lot of credit to our Senator Akaka, who has championed our positions in the federal government to get federal recognition of the Hawaiian people, which that has not happened to this day. I wanna thank the, my colleagues on this floor who voted to, uh, for Native Hawaiians to be finally recognized by the state of Hawaii as equal partners. So I'm hoping as a, as I think I discussed it with you, Madam President, when the, my, uh, our judiciary chairman decided to change the title of this bill and to say, hey, I, I'm gonna, we're gonna, are we caucused on the issue, we agreed. And we talked about this, this title now talking about equal rights. And then I indicated to you at that time, Madam President, gee, could I attach another chapter to this bill? Yeah, to talk about equal rights for Native Hawaiians. And it really distresses me how this body conveniently uses Native Hawaiian values and culture to benefit their own agenda when they, in fact, have not even given the Hawaiians their due, uh, their due justice. I was at a hearing uh, early on when uh, some of my colleagues had questioned the integrity as to whether or not Hawaiians should be able to use their exemptions that they were given in developing their own Hawaiian economic uh, future. Why would that even come up, Madam President? These weren't given at the free will of uh, this body. These were negotiated. These were discussed. It took years of deliberation, similar to what we're discussing today. This issue has been in this legislature for over 30 years. This isn't something that's new. And maybe if we're talking about evolution, which I've heard many times on this floor, then maybe we have finally evolved, Madam President, to finally give the Native Hawaiian people their due justice. So I'd like to uh, close with the remarks of, uh, no, not the remarks, the song of Hawaii Aloha. Oli e, oli e. Yeah, na o pio o Hawaii ne. May we rejoice for the youth of this land, that they may have a better, a future that we can give to them, so they, in fact, can evolve, and they, in fact, can create a society that is equal and free to all, gender-free, colorblind, and it goes on and on. Madam President, this is what I feel that we must malama, which means to take care, and we must ike, which means to recognize, and we must pono, which means to do right. Mahalo. 
Further discussion, members? If not, a roll call vote has been called for. Before we take the roll call, I do want, on behalf of the Senate, thank everyone who have participated in the process, whether you are for or against this issue, that you have all taken the time to send your emails, your phone calls appear at the hearings. There have been a lot of work that went into this that the public do not see. As it was said earlier, this was not the call of the legislature. The governor has called us into this special session. It required a lot of work for the, over the past seven weeks, working together with the House, with staff. I want to thank all the support staff that have helped to make the process a little bit easier. And while nothing is perfect, I commend this body uh, for the process that uh, we have been through. And with that, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Baker? Aye. Senator Chun Oakland? Aye. Senator Dela Cruz? Senator English? Aye. Senator Espero? Yes, for love and equality. Senator Gabbard? No. Senator Galateria? Aye. Senator Green? Aye. Senator He? Yes. Senator Ige? Aye. Senator Ihara? Aye. Senator Kahele? Aye. Senator Keith Agaran? Yes. Senator Kidani? Aye. Senator Kochi? No. Senator Nishihara? Aye. Senator Ruderman? Aye. Senator Shimabukuro? Aye. Senator Sloan? No. Senator Solomon? Yes. Senator Taniguchi? Aye. Senator Thielen? Yes. Senator Tokuda? Aye. Senator Wakai? Excused. Madam President. No. 20 ayes, 4 noes. Let me explain the absence of Senator Wakai. <clears throat> I'd like to send our sympathy to him because his mother just passed away this morning, so that's why he's not here. With that, Madam Clerk. Oh, I'm sorry. Man, we have 20 ayes, four noes, and one excuse. Senate Bill 1 passes third reading. Madam President, we have a supplemental order of the day. Please proceed. House communication numbers 1 and 2 transmit House bills numbers 1 and 2, which passed third reading in the House for first reading and referral to committee. Senator Sparrow. I move that said House bills pass first reading by title and be referred to committee. Senator Sloan. I second that motion. So moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The motion is carried. House Bill 1 and 2 are referred jointly to the committees on Judiciary and Labor and Ways and Means. No further business, Madam President. Are there any announcements today, Senator He? Thank you, Madam President. The, the House bills referred to the Committee on uh, Judiciary and Labor will be heard tomorrow at, at 12 o'clock in room 211. 211. Thank you. Further announcements, members? If not, Senator Sparrow. Prayer and condolences for the mother of our Senator Glenn Wakai. I move that the Senate stand adjourned until 11.30 a.m. tomorrow. Senator Sloan. May God bless the Wakai family. I second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. If there are no objections from the members, the Senate will stand adjourned until 11.30 a.m. tomorrow.